Sandy, can we get a roll call? Commissioner Blanco. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Here. Commissioner Lopez. Here. Chair Dickerson. Here. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, the minutes from the May 15th session, um, which I did not attend, so I will be abstaining. Um, do we, has everyone had a chance to look at them? If so, do we have a motion? I move that we approve the May 15th minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? One. Myself. Motion carries. Uh, public comment period. Each member of the audience may address the commission on any subject within the commission's business. Each member of the audience and each subject is limited discussion of three minutes or as otherwise directed by the chair. This is for items not already on the agenda. Does anyone wish to say or speak about anything and not already on the agenda? Seeing none, we move forward to the consent calendar. The consent calendar is approved with one motion. These items are read only on request of commission members. Should anyone, including members of the public, wish to discuss or disapprove any item, it must be dropped from the blanket motion and considered as a separate item. I understand that Commissioner Blanco is going to be recusing himself from item number two, so we'll go ahead and split these into two, uh, two separate motions. Uh, we'll start off with uh, consent calendar item number one, clean and dash permit amendment at 214 East Donovan Road. Do I have a, do I have a motion? I move that we approve clean and dash permit amendment at 214 East Donovan Road. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. And we'll give Commissioner Blanco just a moment. Item number two, a Centennial Square permit amendment at the southeast or southwest corner of Miller Street and Plaza Drive. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve Centennial Square permit amendment at the southeast corner of Miller Street and Plaza Drive. Mr. Chairman, I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Commissioner Blanco? Okay, item number three. I understand we have a, um, someone gonna be recusing himself from that too? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a business relationship with the uh, landlord, so I will recuse myself from this item. Thank you. Staff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Carol Ziesenhenny, and I will be presenting the project for Michaela's Cosmetology Academy at 408 East Main Street. This is a three quarter acre parcel at the corner of East Main Street and South Miller Street. I'm just gonna get my pointer up here. So East Main and Miller. Uh, this is a 3,600 3, square foot building formerly occupied by Pacific Western Bank. It's my understanding that this uh, site has been vacant since 2015. The site can be accessed from two entrances to the, um, from Main Street and Miller Street. And there is an existing parking lot on the eastern side. Here are some uh, visuals of the existing site from the corner of Main Street and Miller Street. This is looking south um, from Main Street along South Miller Street. Um, as you can see here, there is a declining uh, eucalyptus tree that is proposed to be removed and replaced. As a part of this permit, there, uh, the applicant is also proposing to update the existing landscaping. Um, and as you can see, there is a healthy tree in the background here. The building, um, this is looking at the uh, east entrance from Main Street. Uh, the building is proposed to be repainted as well with this application. Uh, the colors are proposed to be dark gray, um, right here where it's uh, the brown color is along the top, and then light gray in the yellow areas. This is a view of the rear parking lot um, from the alley, looking at the rear of the building. The landscaping here is mostly intact. And then this is a uh, view looking up at, up the alley uh, eastward 
um, at the existing site. And then this is a view of the, the narrower strip um, that extends southward uh, down South Miller to, the, to East Church Street. Um, as you can see, there, uh, the landscaping has receded um, and staff has requested that the landscaping be filled in here as well with uh, ground cover. So this is a view of the site and floor plan. You can see uh, the parking lot here and some landscaping to be filled in. Uh, this is a cosmetology school um, proposed to enter here. So 49 students will uh, be enrolled with business hours between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday, and then hours 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. The project meets parking requirements as well as landscaping requirements. Any and interior improvements will be completed with building permits. So this is a view of a historical landscape plan, the original landscape plan, um, and the applicant has proposed to restore landscaping according to this plan uh, with a few modifications. There is a con condition in the permit requiring landscaping um, improvements according to this plan. So as you can see along uh, South Miller Street, this, this site plan is oriented north is on the right and west is uh, at the top here. As you can see along South Miller Street, there are seven uh, trees present and staff has also requested that four trees be um, installed as street trees along, along this Miller Street frontage. As I mentioned before, there's a condition to remove that declining eucalyptus tree on Miller Street. So the applicant has requested to, um, for a reduction in the number of street trees, street trees required by condition number 21. Um, as you can see, uh, striped out in red, the applicant is requesting to remove the requirement for the four street trees along Miller Street. So the Planning Commission may approve or deny the applicant's request to remove this language or um, require a lesser number of street trees um, along the South Miller Fridge. So that concludes staff presentation. Um, staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission by motion approve downtown permit DT 2019-0026. The applicant is available for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start, is there any, um, continue, is there uh, any disclosure by commissioners of communication with the applicant? No. No? All right. Um, any questions of staff at this time? No. No, okay. Then uh, why don't we go ahead and hear from the applicant. Good evening, my name is Mike Kelly. I'm a commercial agent with Pacifica Commercial Realty here in town, and I was the agent that helped to broker the deal between the landlord and tenant and uh, wanted to ask for a special consideration on items 21 through 26 of the conditions of approval and it's regarding the street tree requirements um, and tree bonding and the landlord uh, being requested to provide an easement for tree maintenance. Uh, the reason we're asking for this is the, the landscaping there already covers approximately 44% of the site, so it's already heavily landscaped and maintained properly by the landlord. Uh, he's willing to replace the declining eucalyptus with a 24-inch box tree like what was uh, requested, um, and he's, as part of his ongoing maintenance, willing to take care of that. Uh, but we are asking for items 21 through 26 to be uh, removed with your consideration. Questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, Mike, the um, why this this is a main a main corner. Um, for our community, obviously, you guys know that. Um, and so, and with the beautification we're trying to do throughout the city, and especially in the downtown specific, you know, plans, uh, we're trying to put more trees in. Uh, why, why wouldn't, what's the big deal about these extra four trees? 
Uh, part of it's cost, but then the landlord was also willing to uh, fill in some of the areas, especially that strip. I think there was a picture of it along mm -hmm. Miller Street uh, to improve the view from the street as you're uh, either coming to or from the mall or the courthouse. Um, he does plan. There are trees there. Uh, he is willing to fill it in with a, a plan to be re reviewed and approved by the planning department uh, by to be presented by his landscaper. Uh, but just the, the cost, really, of the, the trees um, wasn't anticipated when we initially put this deal together. I see. And what do you, what do you assess the additional cost to be for, for each tree? Well, the tree bonding itself, I think, added another $1,600 uh, plus whatever. nineteen twenty five. dollars Okay. Uh -huh. Plus the cost of the trees, the labor to install them. Which is what? I, I don't have that number. 4000 so. All right. Any any other questions? I'm sorry. Approximately four hundred dollars per tree. Per tree. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Any other any further questions? Of yes. So um, you mentioned uh, doing some work along this frontage. What what will that entail? Can you give us an idea of what that work would be along this edge rather than doing the trees? Yeah, it would be uh, updated drought tolerant type plants with with ground cover, whether it's you know bark or some other kind of vegetation uh, to help cover the dirt and not have it look bare that way. Okay. Further questions? Thank you, Mike. Okay, Carol, did I need to show the paint colors, or was that are we good on that? Well, what was that? I have we want to see the paint colors. A couple examples. Yeah, yeah that'd be good. Thank you very much, Mike. And then just one more point on the on the landscaping. I believe the current code requires 15% uh, coverage. So again, we have 44 to 15 that right. are being factored in. Okay. Thank you. I do, have, I do have a question. Oh, there we go. So instead of the trees you're proposing to plant other drought tolerant plants, would you be opposed to including that as part of the condition since you're agreeing to do it? And yeah, we I think can that'll be fine. Yeah, we had planned on doing that with, through the planning department with the building permit. So yeah. Okay. And Mike, I think the I mean staff can correct me on this certainly, but for instance, um, the tree easement number twenty four. I mean, that would be that would still be true of the existing trees. So we would still need. 24 in there because you have existing trees in there that are being dealt with. Okay, I know in the, the prelim it did call for some existing city easements, so I don't know if that's already there perhaps or if that's something new that's being requested, but we could look into that. Yeah, and then of course there's the three street trees on Main, which uh, which you're not asking to have to, to, have to um, not put in, so I'm assuming that 22, 23, and 24 would still be appropriate for if we're still doing 21, which is three trees. Now, perhaps the street bonding may or may not shift on that. I don't know, but uh, but I I can't see that we would remove 22 and 23 and 24 because we still have a portion of 21 there. Yeah, I think 23 would change to three tree plantings at 275 at right. 275 each yeah. we would condition 21 would change for uh, updated drought tolerant plants shall be installed so we're really changing 21 the first sentence and 23 instead of a seven to a three seven to three 
three, and then whatever the total of 275 times three is, there's nine, uh, 825. His staff um, is agreeable to that with uh, with the drought tolerant uh, cover replacing things. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, and you guys are acceptable to those those changes. Being reduced to three trees. Does that include the one for replacing the eucalyptus? Yeah. Okay. Is that the case? Yeah. This is a four street trees shall be installed in Miller, three street trees shall be installed in Maine. And so I don't know if it's, uh, if that's an addition to eucalyptus or, I mean, or, or that's the total. So the way the condition reads at the moment, there are, three trees required along Main Street. And the way the condition is read, the, the existing eucalyptus would be removed, but it doesn't have any language about replacing it. So that's a consideration. Well, so, so maybe well, we could, in there. pardon? So the first sentence says, and the existing eucalyptus tree on Miller Street shall be removed. So you only need a bond for seven. There was four and three, so that's where the seven bonding came, so now we're just going down to three. All right, but, but should we replace the eucalyptus that's being, I mean, should we ask that, that that be replaced? Is it reasonable to put at least one tree back? Yeah. All right. So two, would it be two on Main Street plus the one on Miller to replace it, the eucalyptus? No, it'd be three on, it'd be three on Main and one on, and one on, uh, on Miller. No. So, so the, to the total, there is an existing tree um, along the parkway yeah. here? So there would be two additional trees on Main Street and then one. Oh, is that how? Then I guess it would be. Yeah. Two and one. For a total of three, two and total one. Total of three. Okay. okay. So, um, so one and two. And once again, with the language about the, uh, about the uh, planting the drought tolerant ground cover to beautify that as well. Okay. Okay, so you have the modifications to one, which is uh, one street tree on Miller, two street trees on Main, drought tolerant. Uh, we keep 22 the same. 23 is shifted to three trees rather than seven. At 275 each, was it, so the number shifts to 825, and we keep 24. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Mike. Thank you. Do we have any um, any um, notes from the public that wish to speak? Sandy? No? Okay. Uh, hearing one, I will bring it back to the back to the commission. And uh, any questions you might have for staff or uh, motions that need to be um, need to be put forth? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I move that we approve Michaela's Cosmetology Academy downtown permit at 408 East Main Street with the changes made to number 21 and 23. That's it. That's it. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Item number four. Uh, let's see. Uh, Commissioner Tom? Lopez. Good luck. Item number four, Mattress Express Plan Development Permit at 1000 Tamil Lane. Can we hear from staff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Carol Zizaheni, and I will also be presenting the project for Mattress Express Warehouse at 1000 Tamil Lane. So this is a 1.4 acre lot on Tamil Lane. It's just south of West Bedaravia Road, and 
east of Skyway Drive. Uh, the proposal is to construct a 23,000 square foot warehouse and office building with an undeveloped lot in a PDM1 or planned development overlay light manufacturing district. As you can see from the uh, zoomed up map, all of the surrounding areas are in, uh, industrial or light industrial, commercial industrial, um, commercial manufacturing, excuse me. As you can see to the south here, there is an existing non-conforming uh, 100, uh, 100 home mobile home park that is located in the PDM1 district. And the surrounding uses are either uh, non-public oriented offices or other light manufacturing uses. So this is a view looking from Tama Lane towards the alley. In the background, you can see the mobile home park. This is another view from Tama Lane looking towards the existing uses to the east, the uh, fertilizer distribution business. And this is looking from Tama Lane towards the existing uses to the west. You can see here, this is the proposed site. Uh, this kind of lower cut grass is another a uh, vacant lot that is not part of this development. And then this is uh, one of those office buildings I was referring to earlier. So this is the site plan for Metro Ex Express's regional distribution center. Um, this distribution center is to provide inventory to six retail locations up and down the central coast from Santa Maria to Paso Robles. Uh, the building will house the company's administration, um, and in a two-story office portion at the north end of the buildings, shown here in this light blue color, and with the remainder of the building proposed to, for mattress warehousing in this light lavender color. There are two dock bays right here oriented towards the north, towards Tama Lane. As you can see, here's a, a truck turning template with the um, bigger trucks from the um, from the the mattress uh, creators, the big semis, come in off the alley from Skyway Drive and then back into the docks. The, there are also um, smaller um, distribu uh, distribution trucks that are box trucks that are proposed to use Tama Lane as their entry and exits. So the, the site also meets its landscaping requirement. Um, providing eight new trees along Tama Lane and along the alleyway with uh, the re remainder of the landscaping shown here in light, light green. There's also a patio proposed for employees to sit out on their breaks. The parking requirement is also meet, met um, with 37 spaces required and 37 spaces provided. So here's a view of the elevations. The north elevation is facing Tama Lane, over here on the bottom left. You can see the uh, little shade structure right there for employees. And this is a view of the west elevation with the dock bay located right here. This is an isometric view from Tama Lane. This is uh, Tama Lane right here with the office in the front, break area, dock bays and an overhang here that does not have support poles. Which is the facing to the um, mobile home park? The face would be the south elevation right here. Okay, thank you. And so with that, that concludes staff's presentation. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission by motion approve PD 2019-0004. Thank you. The applicant is available for questions as well. Uh, let's start off uh, with any disclosures by commissioners of communication with the applicant. Are there any? No. Oh. No? All right. And then we will uh, move on to, uh, does the applicant want to uh, have anything they wish to uh, add to this? Not really. No? Pretty clean. Yeah, questions would be glad to answer for you. Does anyone have any questions for the applicant? No. No. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, how about additional questions for staff? this time no okay uh, any communications or from the public 
Then we move on to bring it back to the commission and uh, closing the public hearing portion and uh, any discussions by commission members or motions. We discussed this at length at study session and I think it's a good project so I'm ready to move uh, with a motion. Go ahead. I move that we approve Mattress Express plan development permit at 1000 Tama Lane. Mr. Chairman, I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Good luck, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number five, continued item, Oakley, Port, uh, Oakley Court Apartments General Plan Amendment Zone Change and Plan Development Permit at the 800 block of South Oakley Court. Oh, look at there, it's a seat change. Dude. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I did have an ex parte communication with uh, Mr. Lupe Alvarez, who's the applicant. Okay. I I also had ex parte communications with Mr. Dan Blau and Mr. Guadalupe Alvarado. Great. Thank you very much. Can we hear from staff? Thank you, Chair, members of the commission. So as was noted, this project was continued from the June 19th Planning Commission meeting. Um, just as a reintroduction, uh, this site is located <coughs> off of Oakley Court, north of Newton Way. Uh, the site is presently zoned PDM2 uh, and has an industrial land use designation. The request includes a general plan land use amendment and a rezone uh, to PDR3 to allow a high density residential development consisting of 30 dwelling units. Uh, during the uh, Planning Commission meeting, uh, so here's the proposed zoning of R3, PDR3. As you can see, there is commercial manufacturing, which is an industrial land use to the north, an, an adjacent M2 designation across the railway tracks which lie to the north and east of the project site. However, the site is also adjacent to existing PDR3 and a apartment development to the west. And further to the south on Newton Way is an M, or excuse me, R2 medium density uh, multifamily development. And then uh, lastly, there is an R1 to the southeast, an R1 single family uh, developed with single family homes. Uh, part of the discussion, or the main portion of the discussion at the last hearing focused upon the noise created by the railway. And again, the railway is along the north and east portion of the project site. Uh, the project site wall would be adjacent to the railway corridor. And as a reminder, at the last meeting, uh, the San Maria Valley Railroad spoke out against the project and also provided uh, the commission with a letter in um, opposition of this project moving forward. Their main uh, issue again was the impacts that their trains would cause to the adjacent residential if it was approved. So um, here's a, a site map of the proposed development. The light blue are the units that will be single story. Uh, the violet color are those units that will have a two story, one unit above a second unit. Uh, the uh, red dotted line is the proposed eight foot solid masonry sound wall. Uh, and the commission's questions uh, during the last meeting dealt mainly with the height of the train, the fact that uh, was introduced by the Santa Maria Valley Railroad that the, since the noise measurements that were used in the analysis were older, they have put new horns, new louder horns on their rail uh, equipment. 
and the height of those horns in relation to the wall and any um, potential listener on the project site. Uh, those are the reasons the commission requested a continuance of this project to this hearing to give the applicant some time to revise the acoustic analysis to include the new train horns, the loudness of those, and also to look at what potential noise reduction would be achieved through increasing the height of the proposed sound wall. To refresh the commission, uh, we are analyzing this project per our general plan uh, noise element. That noise element sets interior and exterior noise maximums, and they are represented in a calculation that is uh, a consideration of an entire 24-hour period and averaging all the noise events during that 24-hour period. And so the noise standards for the interior are 45 dB CNEL, which in all cases this project is complying with uh, through some of the mitigations that were included. And then the exterior is 60 dB CNEL with a caveat. And that caveat was added in an amendment to the general plan noise element in 2009, which essentially states that multifamily in an urban situation will likely ex have noise experiences that exceed the 60, but as long as they remain below 75 decibels, uh, that is permitted under our general plan standards. So the typical requirement is 60, but for multifamily, it can go up to 75 dB um, for outside spaces. I would like to note there was a question during the last hearing about notifying future tenants. Uh, this second paragraph of the in, included in the general plan element um, is a standard language notification for multifamily tenants. This language is included as a mitigation requirement. So the leases, if this project moves forward, all leases to tenants will have this language included, notifying them that they're going to be living in a relatively noisy area. So per the request of the Planning Commission, the applicant worked with their acoustic consultant, which I will mention is in the audience today for uh, additional questions. Um, they looked at, first of all, they included the train horn. Uh, they've also revised the table from what was distributed with the commission packet. They've updated it to also include a constant train noise for an entire hour. Uh, the prior table did not include the train noise, but just looked at the horn noise. So this would be, this is a representative table of noise experienced during an hour of train operation as a, adjacent to the site with uh, periodic blowing of the horn. So um, let me step back. So here's our general plan standards. Again, 60 deep CNEL for exterior. So t the column E uh, uh, looks at CNEL and the totals in any case don't exceed uh, 55, essentially. Uh, so in all cases, this project will be meeting the general plan standard under the CNEL measurement. Uh, tape or column C, on the other hand, is reflective of the instantaneous noise of the horn blasting. The, per the commission's request, the analysis looks at a 14-foot wall height, which is shown in the blue area here, and then an 18-foot, um, excuse me, horn height, 14 feet on top of the, the lower engine, and an 18-foot horn height 
that is the taller engine per the Santa Maria Valley Railroad information. They then look at both scenarios under different wall heights. Here you have 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. The um, noise resulting from an 18-foot train horn blasting with an 8-foot wall, and this is um, a, let me move on to the next slide to better explain this. This is a graphic representation of that table. So in this case, this graphic represents the 14-foot train height, 8-foot wall, and a 5-foot tall person hearing the horn. And it's approximately 75 feet between the two, the source and the receiver. So under the 18-foot tall horn and an 8-foot wall height, the receiver is going to experience a noise level of 81.6 SPL. If the wall height was increased to 16, in other words, doubled, that would drop to 69, uh, almost 10 decibels. And in terms of decibel readings per the acoustic consultant, a drop of 10 decibels is an experience half as loud as would be the baseline uh, reading. Uh, so one other point we would want to make, the exception to the outside noise standards of our general plan notes the exposure level of 75 decibels. Therefore, with the 18-foot tall horn, which per the Santa Maria Valley Railroad is an engine that is used on this line. Um, to get below that 75, a 14 foot solid wall would be required. But again, this is for a one time blast of the horn versus our general plan standard, which is the CNEL. So to summarize, the project will meet the general plan guidelines. However, the instantaneous noise will be in excess of the 75 dB that's noted in the exception. And while meeting general plan guidelines over a 24 hour period, there are still going to be loud noise events uh, that will be certainly audible by people living at this complex. One last note, uh, this should satisfy the commission's request regarding what wall height does in relation to noise received. Over the CNEL 24 hour period, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, for individual instances of noise, it will make a significant difference. And that was included as a conclusion in the, the noise analysis. With that, um, I'll bring it back to the overall consideration of the project. And uh, there were a, a couple of things that I would like to hand out um, as we talk about this. So first off, the first item in terms of Planning Commission action is an action on the mitigated negative declaration. Uh, these handouts have to do mainly with the mitigated negative declaration. Um, the first one is a revised Planning Commission resolution. Uh, the city attorney asked for more clear language to be included in the resolution about the fact that Planning Commission is the adopting hearing body. And so that's been added to this revised resolution that Ryan is passing out. Uh, the second set of items are two letters from the Air Pollution Control District. Um, the information regarding their comments on the mitigated neg deck 
have been passed out to the Planning Commission at the last meeting under a separate memo. Uh, the second letter provided is a request or let me rephrase that, is there suggested conditions to be placed on the project? Um, in terms of their CEQA comments, that is what is included in the errata that is ta attached to the um, environmental resolution where staff went through and made the corrections that they had asked for or recommended uh, to the mitigated neg deck. And instead of reprinting the entire document, we just gave you the few sheets that had corrections. And those are shown in, in strikeout and underline. That so, was passed out at the last meeting as well. So, so if, we, if we approve the, the modified version that has this incorporated into it? Correct, that will still be uh, incorporated into it. Okay. The suggested condition letter lists the APCD, uh, Air Pollution Control District's standards in terms of dust mitigation, diesel exhaust from construction equipment, et cetera. Those had actually already been included in the mitigated negative declaration as mitigations. Um, the APCD recommended they be conditions. Staff, there's, they will still be enforced as mitigations. So therefore there was no changes related to that letter. And then in conclusion about both letters, none of the comments change the mitigations, nor do they have any effect on the determination that with the mitigations, there will be less than significant impacts by this project. So the mitigated negative declaration essentially stands um, as amended by the errata and we still have the same conclusion that with those mitigations, the project will not have significant impacts. Certainly. Uh, Ryan Hostetter, I'm just going to add that the reason why we're re-handing out all of the letters from APCDs, they had called last week and asked that uh, we make the commission aware of their comments and specifically a note in one of the letters that talks about requiring a either 1,000 foot buffer from the railroad tracks or it also talks about a combination of design features that can be worked into the project. And that is um, their response to things that they're hearing from the um, Air, California Air Resources Board and uh, for particularly projects that are adjacent to industrial or rail lines. And so in our conversations with them, um, we pointed them to all of the mitigation measures, which are the items that they recommend in their letters, such as the wall, a buffer, um, HVAC systems on the unit so that they don't have to have their windows open, and actually many of the mitigation measures that also cross over to noise mitigation are also some air quality mitigation as well. And so those are already in there. Uh, what we did say was it was not possible to do a 1,000 foot buffer on this particular site and uh, that all the other measures are incorporated. So I just wanted to make you aware that they called us and wanted us to just relay that information to you. Thank you. Frank, go on. So uh, that discussion covers the first action or proposed action by the commission, which is adopting the mitigated neg deck. Uh, the second action is by resolution, recommend the city council approve the general plan land use map amendment and zone change. And then thirdly, we have the plan development permit for the development itself. And the recommendation is by motion conditionally approve the plan development permit um, and that permit will become effective once the city, once and if the city council approves the general plan and rezone for the project. And that concludes staff's presentation. Um, I, I know the applicant is in attendance and has a presentation they would like to make. And again, the uh, acoustic consultant 
Uh, Mr. David Lord is attending as well and is available for the Commission's questions. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, we've already um, disclosed Commissioner Ex Parte communication. Uh, do any of the commissioners have questions for staff at this time? Mr. Chair, I do. Um, <clears throat> so, Ryan, just to uh, just to be clear, the some of the strategies that the uh, that the APCD suggested or recommended for the building to mitigate the the dust and air quality issues. You mentioned those are being incorporated into the conditions. Is that correct? That's correct. And some stuff is incorporated into the design, such as the wall. Okay. All right. Thank you. Further questions at this time? No. Uh, why don't we go ahead and hear from the applicant, Mr. Blau? State your you, name Blau. and address. Yes. Um, Could you state your name and address for the? Mr. Dan Blau, 2353 A Street. Thank you. Um, Frank did a great job of presenting that. I, there are a couple of issues that we still need to address. One of them is <clears throat> you were asking for some additional 24-inch box trees in the project, which uh, the owners are willing to do that. The other thing you asked for is some of those trees to be in between the carport areas, and and, they, and you're also asking for some uh, uh, trees where they have uh, tell me what I'm thinking about. Uh, so, no, that we, we want trees not in between the, the carports because we're planning on putting solar on the carports more than likely to beat the new solar core that's going to be effective in January. And one thing you don't want to do is have I'm sorry, canopy trees, is what I was talking about. Canopy trees and solar are not compatible. <laughs> to give you some example, <clears throat> I put the new solar system for the YMCA and wanted to do the same thing for the country club. The problem is I'd have to, t I'd have to tear down so many trees because they shade the solar plants that the members would have gone crazy. So I have the same thing here. We, we can't have trees on the south side of the solar panels with their canopy trees. So <clears throat> we're agreeable for the 24-inch box trees uh, that they've demonstrated, but not canopy trees that are going to block the solar. Uh, <clears throat> so are you suggesting, Dan, that you're, you're fine with if we want to shift those four trees to somewhere else on the property, but you just don't want them there? Yeah, just can't shade the solar. It defeats the purpose of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I, oh, I need... <clears throat> By the way, it's hay fever. It's been a few days in Hawaii. It was clear as hell. It didn't really help. It was clear as hell. I get back to Santa Maria. Just got off the airplane. It was amazing how that got to me. Um, hmm. uh, one thing I would like to point out is on the, uh, you have a sound engineer here that will give you all the, answer all the questions you have, but I should point out that I don't think it's appropriate that we try and uh, mitigate the horn sound from a train. The reason the sound is 120 decibels, that's what's required by statute. And I should point out to you that your police department, your fire department, their horns are 120 decibels. The point is, you don't want that sound blocked. You want people to know that, that there's something there that's happening, whether it be a train crossing a track or a police car going through a, an excessive rate of speed or a, uh, going through traffic lights. But uh, but I think we beat the rest of the requirements for the sound attenuation. So I'll let uh, David, David, this is David Lord. He's our sound engineer. And I'll let him ask, ask, answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dan. Mr. Lord, if you can state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you, David Lord, uh, San Luis Obispo, California. And our firm did the noise study for this project and I could, uh, I could describe it in detail, but I'd rather respond to uh, questions if there are any. But briefly, I wanted to say that the peak sound level of the 110 decibel horn that we've been seeing uh, is something that lasts for less than 10 seconds any one minute, and therefore does not violate the noise ordinance of Santa Maria. I mean, there's no question about it being in violation. 
but it is audible. On the other hand, audibility is not a measure of uh, compliance. Uh, these horns should be audible, as has been pointed out. So if the horn sounds for 10 seconds in a minute, then the average of that minute is less than 60 decibels, even though the instantaneous sound level is 80 decibels. So the, ordinate, the noise ordinance is written um, on the basis of averages. Uh, L-E-Q means equivalent sound level, which is a kind of, may I say, logarithmic average, uh, because sound uh, escalates like earthquakes in a logarithmic fashion. So 80 decibels is 100 times louder than 70 decibels. <clears throat> So that's the point I want to make, that the instantaneous sound levels uh, are not, uh, uh, are in compliance with the noise ordinance uh, if you look at them as an average over a one minute period. That's the major point. If there are other specific questions, uh, we can go into details. Thank you very much. Questions? I have a question for our attorney. As to the noise ordinance, is that correct, that we're supposed to take the average of one minute? I don't have the specific language, so I, d I don't know. Okay. So the uh, general plan um, noise standards, and let me switch back to the – there we go. Uh, so CNEL is an average over a 24-hour period. Um, this standard of 75 decibels as a noise exposure level uh, does not have a time period tied to it. Uh, my interpretation of it was that the 75 decibels was for any moment in time. Um, let me, if I may, just consult. The noise element. Oops. Hmm. Oh, there we go. <laughs> So here's the standards, and CNEL, DBCNEL, and let me go down to the definitions. Uh, so here is a decibel measure of sound, which people perceive as loudness, and then the community noise equivalent level is uh, sound level during a 24-hour day. So all the noises are, are averaged, and that's how that CNEL is calculated. So the... Um, if you keep that text on the screen, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I will put it back. <laughs> the equivalent sound level is, I think, what we're talking about in, in the case of instantaneous noise and noise over a one minute period. Equivalent energy level is what we are using to evaluate this situation. We're not using the maximum level. L, ma the L max is maximum level. L EQ is an equivalent level averaged over a period of time. So the L max in our case is in the 80s, but the L EQ is in the 50s. Mm. Okay. And there is no statute or uh, provision for that in the noise element uh, for the L max. Sorry, it's quite technical, and, and we're quite confident that we're interpreting it properly, but it's difficult for the average person to understand, and it's, it's outside most of our experience. We, we don't uh, view sound that way. If we, if we hear a horn, it lasts for five minutes, that was it, and you don't forget it for quite some time, but that's not covered in the noise element or in the noise ordinance, those instantaneous sounds. So you're stating that the L max is 80 and the lower is 50, correct? 
the average is yeah. in the 50s. So and that's the, the maximum average. is in the 80s. So the how The maximum did, occurs over a five second period. So how did you get the average to be 50? What was the lowest? If that's the mean, what is the low mark to get to 50? How did you figure understand. the average? So how did you figure the average? The average is, is not an arithmetic average. To further complicate matters, it's a logarithmic average because the, the energy and sound at higher levels is hundreds of times greater than the energy and sound at lower levels, sort of like an earthquake. So uh, as the sound level increases, the energy increases logarithmically. And so we average these sounds logarithmically. And so a, a high sound has an inor inordinate weight on the overall uh, sound during that time period. That's how we average it. And if I may add in, in more of a, a layperson's terms, uh, Imagine all the sounds you like, like that noise this, that can happen during a day. All of those sounds at logarithmic measurements are where this average is derived. Is that correct? More or less. <laughs> so this 54, yeah. let's say, represents all the noise that is happening during a day, including the background noise of just traffic, um, dogs barking, fire engines going by. And what they've done with this study is add the instantaneous horn level and a constant train noise to the background noise of the site and derive this, this number. Mr. Miller, can I, can I ask you just a, a quick question? I'm sorry to interrupt it. The, the scale we have there, um, let's say the, uh, uh, for column C, um, so what you're saying is, uh, what was the multiplier for between the 80 and the 70? Um, I mean, it, you said it, it's not just, as you said, it's, it's, it's logarithmic, it's you know, exponential, it just, it, it is, when you feel a 70 and then you feel an 80, it is X amount more. And the word is instantaneous. Yeah. It's an instantaneous sound that is gone. Uh, and the average level over that one minute period is in the 50s, whereas that instantaneous. No, I was, was asking eight. what the multiplier was. If somebody has a sense, um, uh, for, for instance, like, uh, like the. Um, um, Richter scale. You know, it's, as you said, it's, you know, a, a 6.0 earthquake and a 7.0 earthquake are not one point removed, they're 10 times removed. Thank you. you know, so, so the question I have is what is that multiplier for the, from a 60 to, to a 70 or a 70 to an 80? Is it, is it 10 times? Is it it's, 100 it's 10 times? times? It's 10 times. Okay. Yes. Okay. And did you say earlier that a 70 to an 80 is 100 times? I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's 10 times. 10 times, okay. okay. Yes. yes, sir. Question, so the L max or the maximum level that we're talking about that the city doesn't have any requirement for, do other cities have requirements some, on the max? Some, and some what are the typical requirements? Some cities in Southern California have an L max requirement, but not many cities do. It's what would be a typical, few. in your experience, a typical max for other cities? It might be in the 70s. Okay. Further questions? On the other hand, we have no authority over the Federal Railway Administration. We can't regulate this sound level. It's, uh, it's going to happen no matter, the, because the Santa Maria Valley Railroad is not governed right. by city ordinance. Right. Right. And nobody's trying to nobody's trying to, to regulate their noise. We're trying to regulate the impact of the noise. And so we know what that noise is, right. and it is above seventy instantaneously uh, through a 20, 24 hour period, maybe a few seconds. Right. Commissioner Lopez, did you have some questions? Uh, yeah, just a real quick question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do sound waves travel or propagate? <clears throat> in the direction that they're, that they're from the source, or they, do they radiate outward? 
Thank you for asking that question. Uh, they, they travel in a direction that is determined by their frequency. So high frequency sound travels directly like a bullet. Low frequency sound like boom boxes is radiated all directions. Therefore, a noise wall will not stop low frequency sound. It'll go around the, the noise wall. But high frequency sound, I was speaking of it the other day, as the train goes around a curve, there will be something called wheel squeal. The, the wheels are squeaking as they go around the curve, and those high frequency sounds will be stopped by the noise wall. But the low frequency sound of the engine won't be stopped by the wall. Would you characterize the train horn as high frequency or low frequency? I'd say, I'd say it's broad spectrum, has a little of each, or a lot of each. So the, the, the diagram that you presented in the, it shows it's kind of a section from the source as it heads out towards the receiver. That's, that's pretty accurate as far as the, uh, the intensity of the noise that propagates from the, from the source. Well, you see the diagram is 1,000 hertz. So that's a constant 1,000 hertz frequency. If we were to plot this diagram at 40 hertz or 50 hertz like a boom box, the, the diagram would be very different. Okay. <clears throat> and if we went to 5,000 hertz of speech, it would also be different from this. This is just one frequency, 1,000 hertz. Okay. And the wall depicted it. In the scales that you had the low LEQ, I think, that, that's a masonry wall, right? It's not a, a wood fence. I'm sorry, that is a what? The, the walls that, that are depicted in the study are CMU, 8-inch CMU, 6-inch CMU? Probably, solid masonry walls. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and they stop all high-frequency sound. Okay. Thank you. They don't stop it. They uh, reflect it, and it goes over at a known angle. But it reduces, let me say, by about 10 decibels. High frequency sounds. Further questions? Maybe um, one more question on the topic of the walls is would you say that the uh, noise is attenuated better by a masonry wall, or is there some other material or cover, vegetation? What, in your opinion, would do a better job we, of? We like to say that the masonry wall is the gold standard for noise walls, but on the other hand, there are noise fences that have a resilient material, uh, weighted material in the fence, and that can also stop noise, not quite as well as a masonry wall, but some people use that where it's, uh, it's not a, a critical application. Well, the gold standard sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> further questions? Any further questions of the applicant in general? Mr. Blau, okay. All right, thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. I do have a question. Oh. When, did, you, did you go out to the site and count how many times the horn blew during the 24-hour period? I did not personally go to the site. I mean, I have visited the site, but uh, a train didn't pass while I was there. Uh, but I've, I've read the report from uh, the previous consultant 10 years ago, five years ago. It's a... It's a shifting uh, uh, scenario. Uh, the number of train passengers are, are shifting. Uh, but what we did was we, assumed, we modeled the train uh, horn in our acoustic model. We assumed that it was 14 feet high, that it was, would last for a certain number of seconds. And the model is, is acoustically very accurate. So I did not witness it personally, but we modeled it and that's uh, accurate to within two or three decibels. Okay. All right. Further questions? No. Mr. Blau, do you have anything else to say? Yes, I do. There is. I think uh, Lupe wants to sh show you a few pictures. There was some concern and some comment by the railroad at the last hearing about the trash and the kids and the conflict there. And I just wanted to try and point out that uh, I think this wall is going to eliminate that whole issue, and he's got some issues to, to deal with that. So. Planning Commissioners, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Lupe Alvarez, and uh, I was born and raised here in Santa Maria. I uh, reside in Guadalupe. Um, actually have served my community and 
various forms. I was on the Marion Hospital Board for 10 years, currently on the board for Community Bank of Santa Maria, and I, I was also the mayor of Guadalupe for eight years. So I am involved in my community, and this project will be uh, a well-done project. I, I can assure you of that. We went, I went to Alex and took pictures of uh, McCoy and the Country Club. Those are the pictures you see right there. Many, many of the fences are lattice, six feet tall, with uh, maybe some uh, ivy or some shrubs. Some of the fences are, are uh, wrought iron, some are wood fences. I took a picture of the corner of McCoy and the railroad tracks right there, and that wall is a block wall, and it's seven feet, three and a half inches, I believe. And I showed the picture of the corner, showed a picture, and we do have some bigger ones if the audience would like to see. Can you grab that easel, please? But bottom line is uh, our project will have an eight-foot wall that's solid, that's on the berm, that will stop the noise. And as we just heard the siren, I know the fire chief. I did not pay him to send that fire engine down the street here. Um, but that's what sirens do. They're to alert you. And it's not to uh, scare somebody, but it's to alert you of a situation that could cause serious injury or death. I lived for 10 years 100 feet away from the railroad tracks in Guadalupe. The train of the noise there is louder. It's Amtrak. It's freight trains at full speed. Not, not here. Here, you could outrun the train. You could outwalk the train. So what we're asking is uh, consideration that you move this forward to the city council and that you approve our project uh, as, as it is, with one other exception that Dan also um, uh, uh, did not mention, the HVAC. Uh, there's no apartments in Santa Maria really that have HVAC. Um, that's just not something that's very common. It's very expensive. And the Air, Air Pollution Control Board is using regulations from the state, not from Santa Maria, not from the county of Santa Barbara. Those are from the state. We're not uh, 100 degrees here in heavy humidity, uh, so I also ask that the HVAC be removed from, from the list of conditions. And I thank you for your time. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions? No, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Well, there, one more. There was one picture that I took that yesterday, two days ago, I believe. Uh, there is quite a few trespassers that use that property as a shortcut. And that is a liability, not only for the railroad, but I think for, um, for the city. And that once we have that wall, there won't be any more traffic going through that property. And that, that will be the end of that, that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any um, communication from the public? No? All right, seeing none. Uh, any other um, questions on public or applicant? No. And public comment, is there any public comment? No? All right. Um, so seeing none, then we will bring it back to, um, we'll close the public hearing and we will bring it back to the commission for any questions that we might have of staff or of the applicant. No questions, Mr. Lopez? Commissioner Lopez? Commissioner Blanco, any questions? Um, maybe just one. Um, the existing walls that are to the south, are those going to be modified in any way? Are they going to end up being the minimum height required for the development? The existing walls will remain. Uh, the only condition from the city is the one facing the railroad. The other ones are already masonry, and I think they're in compliant and have been approved when they built those projects by the city uh, planning commission and city council. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, I have no questions. So comments by the um, commission? Anything? After, okay. Comments? Okay. Mr. I just, I think it's a good project. I thought it was a good project last time. I think the applicant went above and beyond to get another look at the sound, and uh, I, I, um, this commissioner's uh, okay with the project. You're okay with the project with the wall being eight feet? Yes, I am. Uh, I, I think there was some, some um, 
saw there was something in here with respect to maybe not one being needed, but it's, it, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with the eightfold. Okay. Commissioner Blanco. Um, you know, after hearing the presentation from this, um, from the noise uh, engineer analyst, um, it, it made it pretty clear as to kind of what we were dealing with and sort of uh, reevaluated things. And I think that that uh, that that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it, certainly, a 16-foot wall makes doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't want that site to feel like a prison. Uh, it just you know, I, I went outside and looked at my basketball hoop that's 10 feet tall, and that seemed pretty imposing to me. Uh, so, um, you know, I think eight feet is reasonable. I think 10 foot would be a maximum, and 10 foot, in my opinion, uh, may help a little bit, but um, I would suggest if we were gonna go anything near 10 feet that it would be maybe softened by a shrub along the front, just so you don't get that imposing appearance of a 10 foot high masonry structure. but. Um, but eight foot, you know, seem reasonable. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, the project overall, I think is very well put together, very well designed. I, I, I agree, I think cutting off that access for people going through there makes a lot of sense. I, I think that's just a safety issue that's sitting there now, a liability issue. So I agree that the development actually, in a way, does mitigate that. So that's, that's very helpful. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't have any other concerns at this point. Okay. Commissioner Hernandez. Yeah, my, my biggest concern was that we wouldn't, or I as a commissioner, wouldn't be able to reach the finding that this is not going to have a negative impact on the adjacent property. We don't have a way to regulate the railroad. They're preempted. So we cannot control when, how they blow their horn. And while that small 10 second horn does blow instantaneously, it still disrupts just like the fire department driving by disrupted us for a minute. So it does affect the quality of the conversations we were having. And so I think that I would be okay with having a taller wall. However, I'm trying to look at this chart and see what would be appropriate for that instantaneous. I don't think asking for a 16 or 14 foot wall because it is instantaneous, but I think finding a different number would be appropriate so that I can make the finding that it does have, it does not have a significant negative impact on the adjacent property. Thank you. Um, you know, anytime you have a, there's a request for um, changing um, what's going on in an area and you end up with competing uses. In this case, we have light manufacturing, industrial, and we have residential around there. Uh, it, it becomes a little bit difficult. You have to find a, a good middle road on these things. Um, I, I like the project. I think that you, that you guys have actually produced a, a really nice looking project for uh, what is a difficult piece of property. Uh, my, my concerns um, are uh, very similar to Commissioner Hernandez's, which are, um, you know, how do we make sure that there is, we deal with some of the impacts that the railroad is going to have and, um, and, reasonably, and reasonably have. Uh, they've been there uh, certainly longer than this project and uh, we don't want to impact their, uh, their business as well. Um, I do understand the, the argument that was made about how this is supposed to be warning people. Well, it's not supposed to be warning people inside your, inside your project. It's supposed to be warning people who are outside the project, wandering around, you know, on the railroad, so uh, on the tracks. So uh, I, I don't really look at that argument as having a lot, uh, holding a lot of water. Um, the if you if we take a look at the 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 chart, um, I understand that there's some hesitancy to go to 16 or 14 feet. Um, but I, but personally, I think 12 feet is probably um, a good number for me. And the reason why is because um, what it does is it brings that instantaneous noise level um, of the 18 foot horn 
close to our maximum. It, it doesn't. It doesn't meet our maximum of 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 being 75 uh, or less. But it's it's awful close to it. Um, you know, quite frankly, if we were to try to meet that, it'd be a 12 or 13 foot, or excuse me, a 13 or 14 foot wall, um, and that may be just a bridge too far for some of the uh, uh, commissioners. Um, so for me, I think a 12 foot wall uh, would. Um, would end up getting my vote on, on this project. Um, I do think that, that we need to, because of that competing, these competing uses, uh, we do need to look at this space a little differently than we would other spaces around there um, or around Santa Maria. Um, as far as the uh, um, the trees go, I, I I get what you're doing with solar. I appreciate it, and you know, moving the trees that's that's no big deal to me. Um, and I do think that we should have HVAC in these things because of because of the things that the uh, the air pollution control district has brought up. Um, I do understand that maybe other parts of Santa Maria don't have uh, don't have those, or most do not have those. But I think is an air quality issue. Uh, for for people who are going to be living uh, in your development right next to the trains and right next to the engines that are going to be going by, um, I think that uh, it, it is not unreasonable. Um, so those those are my opinions on the thing, and we'll see we'll see how it hashes out with the other the other commissioners. Um, we are going to need at least to start the thing off a resolution which would be number 2773, if anyone cares to push that forward. Well, I think we need to get a consensus on this height of on the wall first. Okay. So, so maybe, if I may, sure. a question. So, so the height of, height of the wall, is it essentially the effective, are we talking about the effective height of the wall? Because if the site is already, let's say, two feet higher than the railroad, and you have an eight foot wall, do you in effect have a 10 foot high sound barrier? There was a two foot berm, so it was actually a, it was actually a six foot wall with a two foot berm. So, so if we have an eight-foot wall, are we going to have a ten-foot wall barrier, a ten-foot barrier, noise barrier, effectively? Maybe that's a question for. The, sorry, I forgot your name. David Lord. Mr. Da Mr. Lord. The, the effectiveness of the wall is measured from the top of the wall to the finished grade level where the housing is. So the berm would raise the wall an additional number of feet of the berm height. So it could add another two feet to the wall, top of wall. It's top of the wall to the finished grade that is that we're measuring in our graph. But but if if the site is two feet higher than the rails, do you add two feet to the effective barrier? Does that does that make sense? If if the site is two feet higher than the rails, so the finished grade of the site, yes. and then the berm is on top of that finished grade, and then the wall is on top of the berm. Yes. So you just add add those two, the berm and the wall, to the top of the wall, to the finished grade. The, it's assumed that the rails are uh, at or near the finished grade of the site. Maybe that's mistaken. I, I, I don't know that. I, they appear to be, if you're on the site, they, they appear to be right at the finished grade today. I don't know what the finished grade will be in the future. Okay. I don't know if Mr. Blau was going to ask, answer that. Actually, I believe this site is two feet above the railroad's grade. So effectively, if we do a two-foot berm and a six-foot wall, we have a 10-foot wall in comparison to the grade for, for the railroad track. Now, I do caution you, I mean, think about this. You think adding two more feet to make it a 12-foot wall, for example, because we now really have an effectively a 10-foot wall, or 10 foot above the railroad track. But to go to a um, 12 foot or 10 foot, excuse me, 12 foot wall now doubles the cost of the wall. It's not adding just another course of brick on top. It's a completely different foundation. 
Uh, it's, it's actually double the, the cost per little foot of a wall. So it's, it's a significant issue. So I'm not, not concerned. But you, Personally, I, I understand the cost implications, but I'm talking about the technical aspects of the barrier. If we're getting more, I mean, if the site is already two feet higher, do we in effect add two feet to the effective height of the barrier? Uh, that's, is, that, is that correct? Does that sound? That's what you're saying is yes, that's correct. Okay. I do have a question about this photo where it was measured. Did you measure with the berm? Or was there a berm? I can't there's, tell. There's no berm. I took a picture from the corner, so to show the corner. There's a tree, there's a post right there, a utility post, and I took it right next to that. There is no berm there. It's at at grade. Okay. So it an existing elevation. Okay, thank you. Same as the railroad tracks. Thank you. Commissioner Lopez. Yeah. Uh, no, just just to clarify, that that the, that isn't the site. That's it. No, I know. Okay. But I just, that's what's existing at another location. Right. And, and staff, I, 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 Ryan, are you guys, um, can you weigh in, or is is the is the property, is the development two feet higher than the railroad tracks? I mean, are are we getting some sort of a credit there, or are we, or are we talking about that when, in point of fact, it's not that? Chair, members of the commission, looking at the uh, preliminary grading plan that was provided, grading and drainage plan. Uh, it's unclear as to the height of the rail tracks. Um, the, the wall, the top of the wall is noted as 219, finished floors are at 211. So that's an eight foot wall compared to the finished floor. It's unclear about the height of the tracks, but I would like to direct the commission to the, the graphic uh, that was provided in the noise analysis it appears that it assumes a level height between the site and the railway tracks because this 4.3 meters is the eight, or excuse me, the 14 foot of the trained horn. So for the data on the table, excuse me, wrong direction, for this 14 or 18 foot to be accurate, I believe it's assuming that this is five feet this is 14 feet and it's measured on a level playing field. So if I may suggest in terms of calling out the wall height that the commission would like to see that we um, include in the condition or the mitigation or the motion that the, the height of the wall shall be measured in relation to the height of the railway track. And that way we're assured that this uh, is going to be consistent with the noise information that was provided. My assumption is that it may be two feet or less difference, but uh, if we just include that wording that the height of the wall shall be measured in the relation to the height of the railway track from essentially the top of the wall to the elevation of the railway track, uh, that will cover this concern. I do have a question. Why was 1.5 meters used for the receiver instead of the height of the building? Um, we were talking about outside noise from outside areas. So 1.5 meters is approximately five feet. So that would be an average height for a person standing in the site experiencing the noise. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the noise inside the building due to the way buildings are constructed nowadays, Title 24, which is energy requirements, makes walls and windows and such much thicker, which has a secondary benefit of making them uh, more resistant to transmitting noise. Um, therefore, our main concern was the outside noise experience. Inside, we're assured that the uh, inside noise experience will meet the 45 decibels or lower, lower standard. Did the height of the receiver change if you increased it to, let's say, 3.5 meters? Did it change it dramatically? My understanding, and, and Mr. Lord probably can add to this, that um, with the same distance yep. and the same wall height, 
adjusting the height of the receiver in this case would have little change in the noise received by the receiver. I'd just like to say briefly, it will have some effect. If the receiver is in, on the second floor of yeah. the housing, then they will have more line of sight of the noise source. Therefore, there will be added effect from their line of sight view of the noise source. And they may choose, these residents may choose to close their windows so they don't hear the train. And uh, with good window construction as we have today under Title 24, as has been mentioned, uh, there will probably be very little awareness of the train noise with all windows shut. So I guess what I'm asking is, does the line, does it affect the distance if you go back? So you Excuse increase me. the height of the receiver. Pardon me. Okay. So the distance from the source to the receiver is, in this case, 23? Is that the distance? 23 meters. Okay. If you increase the height, does it become less than 23 meters, just for calculations? Well, what we're look, we assume that the receiver is in an outdoor activity area just at the edge of the building. And let's, let's assume they're sitting in a lawn chair or having a barbecue or something. They're, they're three feet high. And then if they stand up, the ears are five feet high. And if they're on the second floor, right. perhaps 15 feet high. And each one of those positions, if we put a sound level meter, would have increasingly higher sound levels as you move up. Okay. We just chose five feet as stand standard. That's the standard level at which to measure noise. Okay, thank you. If I may also, um, we do have this photograph of the railway tracks. Um, my recollection from being out at the site is the site is slightly lower, uh, but again, you can see there is no large mounding or, or raised elevation. Um, so I do believe the, the wording that the height of the wall should be measured from the railroad track height will work. And then secondly, I just wanted to also just um, show this graphic uh, once more. The light blue are the single story um, buildings. So there won't be any uh, second floor receivers in these areas and uh, the distance, I'm uncertain as the distance to the first, second floor, but you also have, now you're introducing obstructions um, before you get to the first, second floor patios, which are, are located here. So this patio between maybe the right here, they might have a direct line of sight to the rail corridor, um, but this would be over the tops of the buildings, over the tops of the carports, and then the wall as well to, before you reach this first second floor patio. Commissioner Blanco. So, so if, if we went with, a, as you had suggested, Chair, um, a 12 foot tall wall to be close to meeting that max 75 um, noise level, if we said 12 feet from the railroad tracks and the site is two feet taller, higher than the tracks, then in effect we'll have a 10 foot high wall on the property side, which to me seemed like a reasonable height for a wall, right. you know, pushing, pushing the envelope, but at least reasonably tall, not 16 feet, but in effect we would still have the 12 potentially and mitigate the noise a little bit better. I, I, it, it seems like maybe that's a, a reasonable yeah, and I think that's a reasonable way of looking at it. I mean, once again, if, if it turns out that the property itself is a foot, two foot higher than the thing, then they're going to get credit for it. If it turns out that it's level with it, well, then it's going to be 12 feet rather than 10. Would that mitigate the noise for you? I think that's reasonable. Commissioner Lopez? Okay. We've come to consensus 12 foot from the, from the railroad. Um, does somebody want to make a resolution? It'd be number 2773. 2773, okay. 
By resolution number 2773, I move that we adopt a mitigated negative declaration for the proposed project. With the modification of a 12-foot wall based with, on? Well, with modification of the 12-foot wall um, based on the noise? Uh, based on the, on the level of the railroad tracks. Based on the level of the railroad tracks and the trees. The four trees can be moved. And four trees can be moved so that they are not in the parking, covered parking area. Does that seem to cover it, staff? Um, yeah. If I made, I believe we had only proposed three trees for the parking area. Um, these three trees here were the ones that the applicant was concerned about. Um, so I think it is three trees. But yes, the requirement regarding um, the height of the wall measured from the railway tracks is appropriate. Okay. All right. Do we have a second? Anything on the HVAC stays as is? I just want to, I prefer to have it stay as is. I think that's reasonable. If I, I may interject, the HVAC will help with noise reduction on the interior of the buildings and as was mentioned, it is um, a suggestion by APCD if we're not restricting developed development yeah. from a thousand feet away from this rail corridor that one of the methods for improving air quality is to include HVAC systems. Because we are not a thousand feet? Correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a, I'll second that motion. Okay. We need a roll call. Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Commissioner Lopez? Aye. Chair Dickerson? Aye. Thank you. And by resolution number 2774, I move that we recommend that the City Council approve General Plan Land Use Map Amendment and Zone Change GPZ 2019-0001. May I interrupt just a moment to ask a quick question? Did, did this modified resolution need to be referenced in the previous or is this what we did indicate, I mean, go with this versus what was, okay. All right, go ahead, we need a second. Mr. Chairman, I'll second that motion. We need a roll call. Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Hernandez? Aye. Commissioner Lopez? Aye. Com Chair Dickerson? Aye. Thank you. And by motion, I move that we conditionally approve plan development permit PD 2019-0002, effective one city council approves GPZ 2019-0001, and the project satisfies all required appeal periods. Mr. Chairman, I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion carries. Project moves forward, thank you gentlemen. Give everyone just a moment. Do you want the oh, do you guys want the photos back? Um, sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're gone. Yeah, they they've come and gone, but there you go. Paint chips. Watch that city easel, Frank. Make sure it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. That's a, you covered our easel. I know that. Okay, let's move on to item number six, oral reports from Planning Commission and staff. We are so close. Is there any uh, oral reports from commissioners? Staff have something to say? Just on your schedule, we do have a study session tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be discussing the Quest Apache parcel. That's the last large remaining block in between um, by Stoll and Blosser. It's currently under ag and we're processing a specific plan amendment. So we'll be discussing that with you tomorrow at study session. And let's see, we 
are looking toward our next um, meeting with you all being a study session of August 22nd, and then the next hearing, September 4th. Wow, that's quite a... So we okay. have a, a gap there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anything else? I have nothing else for you. Anyone else have anything else? Meeting adjourned, go home. <laughs>